4. Property. A great deal of law is about property. People feel more secure if they own things, if, within limits, they can do what they like with them, and if the things they own cannot be taken away from them without their consent. One of the main aims of law is to increase people's sense of security, and one of the ways it does this is by recognizing and protecting property rights. What is property? Anything that has a money value and can be cashed or exchanged counts as property, land, buildings, furniture, vehicles, leases, money, shares, copyrights. For something to be property it has to be possible for someone to have an exclusive right to it. There cannot be property in something like the air which we have to share with others whether we like it or not. Reasons for protecting property. So the first question about property has to be whether it is right for the state to protect an exclusive right of this sort, rather than to insist that people share things. One reason for protecting private property is that this helps those who own it to be more independent. For this purpose there have to be rules that lay down who owns each thing, who has the best right to it. It is true that not all states want their citizens to be independent, but those that do not nevertheless protect property owned by the state and other public bodies. They also find it convenient to give people some limited rights to private property, since that encourages them to work harder and be more productive. Another reason for protecting property is to make sure that economic and domestic life can be carried on without too much interference by others. A viable economy in home life is possible only if people are not free to take things from others without their leave. It is better that those who are in control of things, who have what the law calls possession, should remain in control and be free to use the thing broadly as they choose until a court decides otherwise. So, alongside rules that lay down who owns what, there have to be rules protecting possession and discouraging even owners from taking the law into their own hands. A third reason for having a law of property is that property law can be used to create assets of a sort that did not exist before, such as patents and copyrights, and in that way reward originality and stimulate enterprise. In practice all societies have a law of property that lays down who owns what and gives exclusive rights to the owners of the thing owned. Certainly the spread of property that results from these rules may be unjust, some may have too much and others too little. But property law is based on the view that even an unjust spread of the resources available to a society is better than a free-for-all. The law of property has to answer three key questions. What counts as property? Who is to own what? What justifies giving a particular person an exclusive right to a particular thing? And how are property rights to be protected? What counts as property? First, what things should count as property? Property must have some value, and things have value only if they can be controlled, and the control, for which the legal term is possession, can be physical or legal. Can one own fish in the sea? Not if they are swimming about freely. But if I am fishing in a place where I have the right to fish and have caught fish in my net I have them in my control and so I can own them. What about those I have almost netted when your boat cuts my net? Can I then claim that you let my fish get away? That is a matter of dispute. Of physical things, the most basic sorts of property are land, including the buildings on it, and goods such as clothes, furniture, and vehicles. The person who occupies land may, if challenged, be able to defend it with his strong right arm or his gun. The same is true of physical goods. But the value of land and goods increases if they are legally secure. Other sorts of property that can be physically controlled have little or no value apart from what law gives it. Take money. The metal in. The coins or the paper in the banknotes is worth hardly anything. Money is worth what it claims to. Be worth only because the law gives it that worth. Law forces those who are owed money to. Accept the coins or notes in payment, and give the state a monopoly, an exclusive right, of issuing money. Property created by the law all these are examples of property based on physical control, or physical control plus a legal monopoly. But sometimes the law itself creates the control needed for property to exist. Copyright is an example. The author of an original article or novel who wants to sell it is in a bad position if, when he loses physical control of what he has written by handing over the manuscript or tape, he no longer has the exclusive right to have it reproduced. That he keeps the ownership of his manuscript or tape is not much consolation if other people can copy it as they please. Copyright, which is a legal invention, gives the author a monopoly of the right to reproduce and copy the original. This right lasts only for a limited period, but while it lasts it gives 
the author the control necessary for copyright to be a type of property of some value. 4. Example. He can sell it. There are, however, objections to monopolies. It is true tie some monopolies, like the state monopoly of issuing money, are necessary, because it would be dangerous to give a private individual the power to issue money. And it is true that every form of property gives the owner an exclusive right of some sort. I have an exclusive right to my apartment. But that does not give me a monopoly of apartment ownership, for there are programs. There is a case for rewarding original work, but it has to be set against the drawback of denying free access to what has been created. Should there be property, for example, in a genetically engineered cell, another sort of property that can be cre created without physical control consists in rights under contracts, see Chapter 5, such as an employee's right to a salary or a seller's right to be paid the price of something he has sold. This sort of property gives the employee or seller an exclusive right, because the payment has to be made to him and no one else. It is of value because of the certainty or likelihood that the payment will be made. Its value is, once again, increased by the fact that, if it is not made, the employee or seller can call on the law to enforce it. Another kind of property of this sort consists of shares in companies. Shares are created by a contract between the company and the shareholder by which the shareholder contributes or promises to contribute to the capital of the company. Much of their value lies in the fact that they have a chance of earning dividends if the company prospers, though they are not certain to. There are, indeed there is no limit to the sorts of rights, since sharing has its place in society. For instance, it seems right, and fits the idea that the chief aim of the medical profession is to heal the sick, that the inventor of a new method of medical treatment, as opposed to a new drug, should not have property in it. If he did, Every doctor who wanted to use the treatment would have to pay for the right to use it. When a new sort of property is proposed, the claim to share and the claim to be rewarded for initiative have to balance against one another. Who owns what? So much for what counts as property. For a system of property law to work, each thing, each item of property, has to be allotted to an owner. The owner is said to have the property in the thing he owns. By owner is meant the person who has the best right to control the thing in the long run, though in the short run someone else may have a more immediate right to it. So I can own an apartment though at the moment it is let to you or mortgage to a building. Society. How can we decide who has the best long-term right to this or that bit of property? Several factors need to be taken into account, of which the most important are rewarding initiative, giving effect to agreements to pay for or transfer things, encouraging trade, and seeing that, that things are properly looked after. Most people would agree that the person who makes something, makes a table, should own the table. The skill or effort that has gone into making the thing gives them a better claim than anyone else. But if the maker made the thing for someone else the agreement between them will decide who owns it. So, if the table was made by an employee as part of his work the employer usually owns it, because that is what the contract between employer and employee lays down or implies. Land, the most important resource, is a special case. Though the law of some countries rewards the initiative of the person who first clears land by giving him the ownership of the land cleared, most insist that only the state can grant the ownership of land that has not up to now had a private owner. Once we have discovered who the original owner of the thing is, it follows, if agreements are to be respected, that the present owner will be the person who can trace his right back to the original owner by one or more sales, gifts, etc. The idea is that owning a thing includes the right to pass on the ownership to someone else by agreement. That person can in turn pass the ownership of the thing on to another, and so on in a chain which can continue so long as the thing still exists. Sometimes, however, the ownership of a thing is transferred without the owner's consent. In certain cases this is inevitable. If an owner dies without making a will his property has to be transferred to someone. Who that is must be settled by a rule of law, unless the property is to be taken by the first comer or forfeited to the state, neither of which seems a good idea. The law of intestate succession, which deals with the problem of who is to succeed to the property of those who do not make a will, deals with this difficulty by giving the thing to a close relative, the sort of person who most people would be likely to want to give it to, if they had thought about it and made a will in time. When the owner loses his ownership without consent there are also some cases in which the ownership of property is transferred against the owner's will, 
For example, if he cannot pay his creditors and becomes insolvent. In that case, arrangements are made for an official to sell his property and distribute the proceeds up to the amount of his debts to his creditors. His duty to pay his debts is given priority over his rights as an owner. These rules for deciding who the original owner of a thing is and who is the present owner seem straightforward enough. But they do not fully meet the aims of encouraging buying and selling and of seeing that property is well looked after. If these aims are to be met the owner will, quite apart from the case of insolvency, sometimes have to be deprived of his ownership without his consent. As regards buying and selling, the difficulty is that someone who wants to buy property may not know whether the person who offers to sell it to him is the owner. He may be a thief or someone who has bought the thing from a thief. How is he defined? Out. One answer is that there should be a register of ownership that the buyer can consult. In many countries there is a public record of land ownership, a land register, which records who owns what land. That is convenient for the owner, and for anyone who wants to buy the land, or to lend money on the security of a mortgage over the land. Registration of title, as it is called, is convenient and safe because the state guarantees that, with minor exceptions, the person recorded in the register as owner really is the owner. But for most ordinary goods a public register is too expensive or inconvenient. In the absence of a register someone who wants to buy, say, a laptop computer has to assume that the person who has it and offers it for sale owns it. Yet clearly he may not. He may have borrowed or hired or stolen the laptop computer. Two ideas about ownership, then, compete. One is that a person cannot be deprived of his ownership. Without his consent, this idea gives priority to long-term security. It follows that if I lend or hire my laptop computer to you or you steal it or find it left in your office and you then sell it to Jane, I can claim it back from Jane. This is true even if Jane thought it was yours and paid for it as it was. I do not have to pay Jane what she paid for it. When she bought the computer she took the risk that it did not belong to you. The alternative idea is that when a person buys something in good faith the buyer's security has priority over the owner's. On this view Jane is entitled to assume that you own the computer unless she knows whether there is something to indicate that you do not, for example it is stamped with my name. It follows that once the computer is handed to her she owns it and it no longer belongs to me. Of course I can claim compensation from you, but that may not be worth much. A compromise view is that, if I lent or hired the computer to you, and you sell Jane the computer, I lose my ownership, but that I do not lose it if you stole it from me and then sold it to. Jane. In the case of loan or hire I part voluntarily with the possession of the computer and take the risk that you will sell it. In the second I do not. Someone has to bear the risk that the seller may not own the thing. Many countries treat the owner's security as the dominant aim of property law, so far as ordinary goods are concerned. But as regards money and, to a lesser extent, documents like checks, called negotiable instruments, law treats the security of the person to whom the money or check is transferred by way of payment as more important. A person who is paid money is therefore in a better position than the buyer of ordinary goods. He usually cannot know whether the person who pays him owns the money or has stolen it. But once he is paid, he becomes the owner of the money, even if it was stolen, so long as he does not know that it was stolen. It would have a trade and private dealing too much if we had to take the risk that people who pay us are not entitled to the money that they pay with. That is one of the ways in which an owner can lose ownership of a thing without his consent. Ownership can also be lost through the passage of time. Suppose that a thing, say a table, is taken from or lost by the owner and that he does not take steps to recover it. The taker or finder takes possession of it and treats it as his. After a period, which varies in different countries from a few years to as many as 30, most systems of law transfer the ownership of the thing to the new possessor. Or they lay down, what amounts to the same thing in practice, that the owner cannot recover the thing from the present possessor. The idea is that it is better for someone who is interested in the thing, even if they have taken it dishonestly, to own it rather than someone who over a long period has taken no interest in it. This can apply even when there is a public register of ownership, such as the land register. The registered owner who takes no steps to recover possession of his land over a long period may find that he has lost the ownership of it. The protection of property rights. So much for the problem of deciding who owns what and how ownership can be lost. In protecting property rights. 
Law has two main aims, to protect the owner and to protect the possessor. Let us take the owner first. The owner is the person with the best long-term right to the possession of the thing, so there are two ways of protecting him. One is to give the owner a right to claim the thing from anyone who cannot show that he is entitled to keep it temporarily, for instance because he has hired it from the owner. The second way is to give the right to claim not to the owner but to the person who is immediately entitled to possess the thing, who may or may not be the owner. This second way protects the owner in the long run. The owner is always entitled to possess the thing in the long run, but not always in the short run, for example a lessee is entitled to possess the flat he has leased until the lease runs out. The difference is one of legal technique. Some countries adopt the first technique, some the second. If the owner establishes his claim, it does not always follow that. The court will order the person in possession to hand over the thing to him. Sometimes courts order a similar thing or an equivalent in money to be handed over instead. The rules vary a bit. From one country to another. If the thing is unique, and in the way that a plot land or a painting by a famous artist is unique, a court will almost certainly order it to be handed over, but if it is a vehicle or some other mass-produced item, some countries are satisfied with ordering an equivalent in kind or money to be given over. The protection of possession. So much for the way in which the law protects the owner. But to protect the owner is not enough if the law is to promote social peace and harmony. To discourage people from taking the law into their own hands, from resorting to self-help, the person who possesses a thing without owning it also needs to be protected. So all systems of law protect possession as well as ownership. The legal idea of possession is a refined version of control and takes account to some extent of custom and social convention. For example, a host possesses a chair in which a guest is sitting at a table because, although the guest is actually using the chair, by convention it is for the host to decide who should sit where. Laws that protect the possessor typically lay down that a person who is dispossessed of a thing can get it back from the person who took it. So, if you take the motorcycle I have been riding without asking me, you dispossess me and I can take it back without asking you, provided I don't use force. If someone else took the motorcycle from you, he uses it to possess you in turn and you can claim it back from him though you don't own it. And if I use force to get the motorcycle back from you, there are countries where the law would make me return it to you before I can claim it back from you, even if I own the cycle. These countries treat the question of who has been wrongfully dispossessed of the thing and who owns it as quite separate. They lay down the question whether I have wrongfully dispossessed you of the motorcycle has to be decided before the question of whether I own it is decided. This roundabout way of dealing with the matter is meant to discourage people from taking the law into their own hands. But not all legal systems adopt it. Some prefer the simpler method of deciding both issues at the same time. Protecting ownership makes for long-term stability and protecting possession for short-term stability. Both have a place in a system of property law, but it is not easy to decide on the best way of achieving a balance.